Hi, I'm the MedPot engineer, John Turmel, and uh, I had 26 consolidated appellants in the Federal Court of Appeal on January the 11th who were asking to have their exemptions, which had been invalidated by Justice Manson two years early, returned to them. Because essentially what he'd done was he had validated everybody's grow permits back to the beginning, but then he said those people who'd expired in that first half year, your possessed permits aren't going to be are going to be validated. Only those who are still alive. Well, how come he could validate grow permits whether expired or not, but he couldn't validate the I mean the possessed permits you need for the grow permits whether expired or not. Get it? So, twenty six people filed appeals for having been left out and wanted their exemptions back the most everybody like that had valid grow permits but not the possessed permit they needed to make it work they could cultivate it but they couldn't possess it so they all end up now at the appeal and I was the lead appellant so this is their case and then at the end of it I'm gonna read the judge's decision I just got which will be the first time for me too and uh, you get to decide how you think this is gonna end up playing out. January 11th, 2016, Federal Court of Appeal. Clerk says, this session of the Federal Court of Appeal in Toronto, presiding our Honorable Justice Peltier, Justice Stratus, and Madam Justice Gleason. Court file number A34214 in the matter of John C. Turmel and Her Majesty the Queen, representing the appellant, Mr. Turmel, and for the respondent, representing, representing John Bricker and Andrea Wheeler. She's also the crown in my action against the Chief Electoral Officer, T-56115, to strike the 40-year-old $250 cap on auditor's fees for election candidates so I don't have to pay the difference in this higher-priced era for a zero-contribution campaign. Justice Peltier said, Afternoon, Mr. Turmel, this is your appeal. This is set down for two hours. That means your share is one hour. Go ahead, we'll hear you. And I said, I'll read chunks from my memorandum and fill in the gaps, but I'd like to introduce the appellants involved here. Ray Turmel, my brother, has an authorization to possess, but needed to have an interim exemption from the laws because he was arrested for growing too many plants. Because Health Canada have a requirement on the limit of the number of plants without realizing that whereas some people might grow 60 big ones, other people want to grow 600 mini buds on a stick. Their plant limit is a flawed parameter, which we are challenging in our original action below. And that's why he, with an ATP, needed an exemption. As well, he needs relief from many of the onerous conditions of the old MMAR at the time. And he was facing mandatory minimum. The other one is Terrence Parker. The Terry Parker, the epileptic who won in 2000. And under his name, the Ontario Court of Appeals struck down the prohibitions on marijuana, lacking, absent, a medical exemption. So Parker's decision says you need a medical exemption for the sick in order to keep it prohibited for the healthy. The other one is Art Jakes, an appellant who needs to move. His designated grower has been changed and he needs to move his operation to his home. And after the Manson decision, that could not be done. Finally, we have Robert Roy and Stephen Burroughs who could not be here today, and they were what we call leftouts of the Manson decision, whose exemptions had expired before that relief was granted, and therefore they were left out. So those are the main categories of appellants, and myself, I'm the healthy one. I want it for its benefits, in particular neurogenesis. The University of Saskatchewan says it grows new brain cells, and I want all the brain cells I can get. And for the prevention of all the diseases it's good for, once you got it, before I get them. So those are the five distinct categories of appellants involved here. In 2013, Health Canada announced the repeal of the MMAR on April the 1st, 2014. April Fool on the sick, to be replaced by the MMPR, which would no longer license private production of marijuana. By April 1st, 2014, there were only six licensed producers unprepared to supply tens of thousands of patients to prescribe 15,000 kilos a month at that time. The 26 appellants in this consolidated appeal are among numerous court-dubbed 
self rep termel kit plaintiffs who filed a statement claiming federal courts seeking declaratory and financial relief for violations of rights under Section 7, including an order that the MMPR that came into force be declared invalid, unconstitutional, and that the MMAR 2, the old one, and absent a constitutionally acceptable medical exemption, the prohibitions on marijuana in the CDSA are to be struck with Schedule 2. Now, that is the request because we are seeking repeal. And the only way to do that is to take it off the list of banned substances. In the alternative, pursuant to Section 24.1 of the Charter, for interim or permanent exemptions for those people who had authorizations to possess before. Finally, damages for the loss of marijuana plants and production. That's the action below. That's not involving this appeal. It's just background. The grounds of the action below are for Mero MMAR repeal because 16 constitutional defects in the MMAR. And then 20 constitutional defects we raised in the MMPR. And absent a viable medical exemption pursuant to R versus JP, we want the striking of the word marijuana from Schedule 2. We seek to have the MMAR and MMPR declared invalid by the many constitutional flaws. Both regimes require recalcitrant doctors to sign. And as long as doctors have the right to say, I don't want to give you the medicine you want to try, that should be unconstitutional. Both do not provide a drug identification number. So there's no opportunity for financial reimbursement for those costs. Three. They require annual renewals for permanent diseases at constant angst for patients and doctors. Four, both regimes require unused cannabis to be destroyed. So, when you get your 150 gram package this month, if you didn't use it all last month, you're supposed to destroy it. And now, if you overuse this month and run short, you're out of luck. Who dreams this kind of stuff up? How malevolent to make people destroy the remainder of their previous load before they can get a new one. Five. Then there's the refusal or cancellation for non-medical reasons. Now, under the MMAR, Health Canada revoked the exemptions of 2,000 people in Nova Scotia and the East Coast because the doctor who prescribed it to them did not return to his Ontario office to sign the form. 2,000 people cut off by the bureaucrats at Health Canada because the doctor signed the forms in the wrong town. That's what we're dealing with. Malevolence. Genocidal malevolence. Now, I mentioned Stephen Burroughs was one victim who got his meds cut off for this non-medical reason and had to find another doctor after his was revoked as fraudulent. The doctor wasn't licensed in his province. That's fraudulent, they said. Now, I didn't say that to the court. That's my comment. And Health Canada feedback on dosages at the time, six. They just complained about anything over five grams to the doctors and scared many off. Seven, both regimes don't provide instantaneous online processing. Both regimes took six, seven, eight weeks to process, and the MMAR used to take two years in its original form. I have several cases that I helped that did take two years to finally get their exemption. Both regimes did not have capacity to handle high demand. Nine, both regimes prohibited the non-dried forms of marijuana, which we raised, as well as the Allard case raised, too, which was just recently won by Smith at the Supreme Court of Canada that said, if you don't let people convert it to oil to put on their tumors, but doesn't work. Therefore, you're violating the right to life. And we're saying that's such a serious violation that back in 2003, when the Hitson case declared there'd been a violation, that the MMAR had failed to function. Then they quashed JP's charge because the Parker decision wasn't complied with. And 4,000 more charges they withdrew during those two years. Well, now that the Supreme Court of Canada has ruled that the exemption has been flawed by the lack of ability to use oil and derivatives since the beginning, I didn't say, we have exactly the same kind of bad exemption, which means no offense. And that's why on Friday in Ottawa, the Crown withdrew cultivation charges for 2,879 plants after he made a motion to quash on the grounds of the Supreme Court decision, saying they had no reasonable chance of success. That's the Crown saying no chance of success against Turner. Forgot to mention Turner. But they didn't let 
They didn't want to let everybody know that this thing has struck down the law. They got a hundred suckers a day pleading guilty with lawyers. So they let this guy off with 2,800 plans, saying there's no reasonable chance of success of conviction. Couldn't convince the judge that he had been cultivating when they only had 2,800 plants. I should have joked. So big stuff has happened, including the Smith decision, and we brought it up too. 10, not exempt from CDSA Section 5, trafficking. Either regime will not let anybody trade their pot back and forth to try different strains. People with exemptions need to be able to try different strains to find what's going to suit them best. And that prohibition in Section 5 is a constant, deleterious form of impediment. Now, those are the 10 big ones we call our common flaws in both regimes. And Hitzig only raised one, I should have said. The drive. Now, the MMAR itself, for the growers, had some bad. Like it required you couldn't have more than two licenses per grower when a grower could grow for 10 if it's only 20 plants each. And you're prohibited more than four growers per site when a big site could have 10 guys in there economically. And the number of plant limit. I explained how that's improper when small butt on a stick is more effectively harvested by sick people than dealing with big plots and big plants. So that number is silly. It should be the amount of pot in your limit and you shouldn't be over it. But saying you can't have enough plant, my brother was busted with four pounds towards his 11. He was way under his limit, but busted for growing too fast. Can you think of anything more stupid than that rule and not allowing any gardening help? If you're sick and you run your own garden, nobody's allowed to help you. Okay, what kind of malevolent people came up with that? But the re new regime, MNPR, now get this, on top of the first 10 terrible things they had in both, now, uh, 12, the licensed producer may cancel your prescription for business reason. Oh, sorry, I'm out of stock. That guy's going to pay me more. You're canceled. Non-medical reason. And then finally, 13, prohibit return of medical document to cancel E. He's got to go back to the doctor. Who thinks up this stuff? 14, they prohibit production in a dwelling. We complain, LRD2. Uh, obviously, he can't produce. 15, and then prohibit outdoor production. We complained about that like Allard did too. There are minor complaints, and I should have said because, let's face it, sun's pretty cheap. And continuing on, 16, there are no rights to brand genetics. And geez, half the genetics in the country were destroyed after the Allard decision that cut off half the people. Think about that. Mm. 17, still no removal of financial barriers. 18, they still do not. Well, now they have a central registry for police checking, so drop that number 18. 19, and of course, they don't have enough licensed producers to supply demand. And I should have gone into the numbers, okay? Six guys to come up with 15,000 keys, which was the last prescribed dosage, says the Manson decision. And uh, 19, of course, they don't have enough. And 20, prohibiting processing of more than 150 grams. They won that in Allah. And I should have mentioned that they are doing it on the basis of it being unreasonable, the 150, and I'm doing it on the basis of the 150 gram limit being based on fraudulent surveys that I caught them. Now, on April 8th, the Crown filed a notice of motion for a stay of all actions below, and they won it. And yet, the Allied case represents only four of our 20 complaints against the MMPR and four little ones. But we all got our actions all stayed below on the basis that resolving these four mini-torts would go a substantial and significant way towards resolving our 20 big ones. So, on March 21st, 2014, the Allard decision, the first one with Justice Manson, dealt with asking for interim exemptions and a remedy from the MMAR, which was expiring in two weeks with the MMPR coming in. At that point, Justice Manson, in his decision, he grandfathered all the production permits back to October the 1st, and I should have said expired or not. But then he did not grandfather all the possessed permits too, and I should have said somehow now expiry dates were important. <clears throat> we'll take the example of Robert Roy. On March 18th, the very day of Manson hearing, his exemption expired. So had Manson. So Manson J 
came down with his decision that day. No, had Manson J come down with his decision that day, then Robert Roy would have been able to keep his garden. But the judge reserved his decision for three days, and the next day Robert Roy's exemption expired. Two days later, he finds out from the judge that, yes, his cultivation permit's now renewed all the way back to October the 1st with everybody else. But only those with current exemptions as of today are valid. Then that means Robert Roy lost his exemption because Justice Manson took three days to come up with his decision, a non-medical reason. Now, at that point, there were about 36,000 grow permits out there, and you'd assume there are about half in the first half of the year, or should I say the year, and about half in the second half of the year. So by April the 1st, that's half a year. Most people who had grow ops and their permits expired, like Stephen Burroughs. He had a huge tumor on his crotch and by using cannabis oil had it reduced it in half, which is one-eighth the volume. Then he was cut off and his exemption expired. He wasn't going to renew for just a couple of months. He wasn't going to renew. He couldn't put in the crop that fast. And he just lived on his stash like most of the other people did who expired in the first half of the year, about 18,000, waiting to see what Judge Manson would do. And then Judge Manson comes up and says, everybody who's still lucky enough to be alive, you get to keep your cultivation and possess permits to keep them alive. And everybody who expired, you can have your cultivation permits, but you can't possess what you cultivate. And that's what happened to 18,000 people, one of whom is dead, David Shea. And that's another issue. So a bunch of them now, we filed our applications, our actions for repeal of marijuana, to straight the word, as well as we asked for interim exemptions from the prohibitions pending action. That's what this is about. In those motions, people filed applications for those interim exemptions pending the action, and it was heard by Justice Stanley. And in the affidavit I prepared for them, I just put down your authorization to possess number, where Health Canada has all the details of everything you gave them medically, and what your doctor signed and stuff like that. Justice Strata asked, can I just confirm one thing? I'm sort of interrupt. What you're describing now is the lead up to the May 7th order. Yes, we're still there. We're dealing with how the Allards fit in here. Right. So on March the 21st, half the people get cut off. We had a few people doing an action for repeal. But then suddenly a whole bunch of left outs decided they wanted to ask for interim exemptions too because they'd qualified previously, couldn't understand why the judge said, you belong to the group with the right to this medicine, but then he only gave it to half the people. So there was an appeal by the Crown. They wanted everybody cut off, no more grows. And the Allards cross appealed and asked that everybody have a right to grow again, expand the relief, I should have said. At the appeal, this is the important part, I want to read the decision of the court. The Court of Appeal just, uh, Justices Nadon, Webb, and Boivin ruled. While the judge carefully crafted and tailored his order in a way that he considered min minimally intrusive into the legislative sphere, Judges Reasons, Paragraph 121, it does not provide a remedy to patients who held valid production licenses on September the 30th, 2013, but whose authorizations to possess expired between September 30th, 2013 and March 21st, 2014, the date of his order. The judge's choice of March 21st as his cutoff date has the effect of excluding Ms. Beamish and Mr. Hebert from his order. I should have said, and 18,000 more people. And with respect, the difficulty with the judge's finding is that although he provides a right, the interlocutory injunction, to the four respondents, Mr. Allard, Mr. Davey, Ms. Bemis, and Mr. Hebert, he does not, in contrast, explain why he deprives two respondents, Ms. Bemis and Mr. Hebert, of a remedy. But he had more about that later. After careful reading of the judge's reasons, I'm left to speculate as to his intention. Well, actually, Justice Manson had explained five times why he'd done it, but they just didn't find it valid to not even notice. Five times he'd mentioned why he'd done it. I'll get to that. So, in these circumstances, he said, I cannot address properly the determination the respondents are seeking, as I'm unable to understand whether the judge intended to exclude Ms. Beamish and Mr. Hebert, or simply forgot to deal with their circumstance. 18,000 people did he forget? So instead of fixing it themselves, they said, in other words, the judge's reasons do not allow this court to perform its appellate function. After after considering making an assessment of the evidence, I believe the wiser course is to return the matter to the judge with the direction that he specifically addresses the situation of Ms. Beamish 
I should have said left out. And Mr. Hebert, needing an amendment. I would remit the matter back to the judge for determination solely on the issue of the scope and a remedy, which we're trying to have extended as they did, more particularly with respect to Ms. Beamish and Mr. Hebert in accordance with these reasons. Though the Court of Appeal could not speculate as to why Manson G had granted a class a right, but then had denied that right to half the patients, now condemned to no relief for their pain and even death, rather than immediately expanding the relief themselves, they returned it to Justice Manson and asked if he'd forgotten it. On December 30th, Justice Manson replied. He said, upon having regard to the Federal Court of Appeals decision dated December 15, 2014, this court orders that, one, the plaintiff's request a reconsideration of my decision of March 21st, 2014. Well, actually, the Court of Appeal requested his reconsideration, not the plaintiff's. Seeking an order that all patients that held valid authorizations to possess on March 21st, or in the alternative, September 30th, are covered by the exemption order I made. Well, of course, all the ones on the 21st are. And to, or, I didn't say that, and to order that all patients exempted by the order, including Mr. Hebert and Ms. Beamish, and others similarly situated can change their address form with Health Canada pending trial. Now, of course, if there'd been an interim exemption, they wouldn't need that. They'd be exempt wherever they were growing. As stated, the judge, as stated above, the Federal Court of Appeal remitted the issue of the scope of the interlocutory injunction for clarification only to specify whether the injunction applied to Ms. Beamish and to Mr. Hebert. There is no reconsideration to be made and certainly no expansion of the scope of my decision to apply to anyone other than the plaintiffs in the proceeding. In considering the balance of convenience, I specifically chose the re relevant transitional dates of September 30th and March 21st to limit the availability of injunctive relief to extend only to those individuals who held valid licenses to either possess or produce marijuana for medical purposes as those, as of those relevant dates. But we still don't know why. According, I should have said, hey, they were expired grow permits were renewed. Why not expired possess? I forgot to say that. Quote, accordingly, only those plaintiffs who had a valid license on September 30th, 2013 could continue to produce marijuana for medical purposes. And only those plaintiffs who held a valid authorization to possess marijuana for medical purposes at the time of my decision on March 21st could continue to so possess or produce. You can't produce without a possession license. So denying the possession license nixes the production license. Finally, quote, in considering the balance convenience, the remedy I granted was intended to avoid unduly impacting the viability of the marijuana for medical purposes regulations, MMPR. And to take into consideration the practical implications of the MMAR regime no longer being enforced, even though its rules are still being enforced for the, those who survive. I didn't say that. So to protect the financial viability of the MMPR, Justice Manson forced 18,000 patients off their cheap self grows onto the expensive MMPR, and the majority couldn't even sign up. But it was to defend the viability of the MMPR. Now, in his decision, while he repeatedly pointed out he was protecting the market viability of the MMPR, if not the viability of the patients, in his actual decision, which I'm now going to read to go to, Five times he mentions the viability of the MMPR. And yet the Court of Appeal, when they go, how could he leave half of the people unprotected, never even thought of the viability of the MMPR as a logical, reasonable reason for having cut off half the group. After that decision, where he'd said no, John Conroy filed an appeal of the Allard decision. Late, so he had to get an extension of time, and that took a whole bunch of months. But still, it was the right thing to do. But he did not file a motion for interim exemption. Back to the guys who couldn't understand why they didn't get the protection they should have had. And he could have been in front of you guys, this level of court, in three days once he'd filed his notice of appeal. But he filed a notice of appeal, didn't actually move for interim relief. Then, after three, four months, with the Allard case coming up below, he decided he's going to discontinue the appeal of the Manson decision, cutting everybody off to the Court of Appeal, so he could now apply to Justice Phelan appear 
to vary Justice Manson's carefully crafted decision, which Justice Phelan then told them, I got no jurisdiction to do. Now, did Mr. Conroy not know that he can't ask, appear? No, did he not know that this is something you got to go to the Court of Appeal to? Especially when my case below was stayed because the Allard case was being run by such a professional who abandoned the, an appeal to the right court to take his suckers to the wrong court. And that's what happened below. So now, all these people here who are left out, they made the application to the federal court to appeal themselves, the Manson decision themselves, because they were in the group. But the court ruled they didn't have standing. Only John Conroy's two people, Tanya Beamish, who was left out, and Hebert, who can't amend, can move, are the only two people allowed to appeal who have standing. Since they're not appealing, all these people lose their exemptions forever with no recourse whatsoever. So that's the state of events right now um, with all these people, plus the 18,000 out there who lost their right to grow their own cheap medicine. Now, when justice failing, the right remedy is an interim exemption for personal medical use. Now, when the Allards made a motion for an interim exemption, they didn't ask for personal medical use. Should have said, and for permanent exemption, it too is without limitation. They're going to get that refused. They asked for the right, to, oh, wait a minute. They didn't ask for personal medical use. They asked for the right to traffic the kids in the schoolyard. Now, Justice Manson, of course, said, no, 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 no. I can't give you an exemption without limitation. Interim exemption dismissed. Now, our interim exemption for personal medical use, we explain that when Terry Parker was first, his charges were stayed, and I'm pointing at him, his judge granted him an exemption for personal medical use. He couldn't sell it to the kids. He couldn't traffic it. He could do everything else except as long as it was for his personal medical use. Then, when the Court of Appeal won, they again gave him a one-year extension for personal medical use, limited not by breaking any laws, as long as it's for you. And finally, Justice Moldover issued a third exemption, again for personal medical use. No overt stated limitations on it on anything, just personal medical use. Yet, Justice Phelan dismissed our motions for interim exemptions for personal medical use on the grounds that Justice Manson had dismissed John Conroy's interim exemption with no limit. I can only repeat that again. Our motion for interim exemption for Terry Parker for his fourth for personal medical use was denied because Manson denied it to the Allards who asked for too much. That's the only reason. Therefore, since these courts have always found that interim exemptions for personal medical use have always been the remedy to solve these things. People know if they're, Justice Phelan said, that leaves too much discretion to Terry Parker. Yeah, he's got the discretion to do anything that doesn't break the law, and he knows what that is, personal medical use. So interim exemptions right now for the people who are, uh, who are cut off is the only logical remedy available at this stage. And short of you simply expanding the relief and say that everybody who has a cultivation permit has a possessed permit too. And if you think the viability of the MMPR should be the great reason for cutting off half of Canada's sickest patients from their cheap medical supply of medicine to force them onto the financial regime, whoa, then we're going to lose. But the point is that other court of appeal in Allard did not find it reasonable when they couldn't fathom why half the people were cut out. So we are here asking to get them back in. And too bad we didn't have exactly the same other panel, you know, saying, hey, let, let us back in, please, now that you know it was the MMPR viability that he'd mentioned five times before that you hadn't even realized was his only reason. And the last part now. So they've all got their applications for interim exemptions, and they were dismissed for lack of medical evidence by Justice Faith. And I had put in the authorization to possess numbers. He said he wanted to see copies of the actual documents. You think that's a good enough reason for cutting people off their medication? There's your number. Government's got it. Do you actually have to see a copy of it? That's, how is that going to help? And I now add, once they see you have a license plate, do they really need to see your permit? As well, he said there was insufficient medical evidence. 
Well, excuse me. It's the doctor's job and the doctor's competence to decide on medical evidence, and the courts have no business asking to see the medical evidence. Once the doctor said this guy qualifies, the court's got no right to say, I want to see the x-rays too. Steve Burroughs, when he spoke to Justice Phelan, he had his x-rays of his lumps in his back pocket. Didn't even know they would be needed until the decision comes down after, and he's told, you should have shown me the pictures of your x-rays. That's the major error done by Justice Phelan, which is playing doctor, something he's not competent to do. As long as they could prove their doctors signed those prescriptions, that is really all they should have needed to prove in an affidavit that they were qualified and had been qualified. And I should have added, Stephen, sa oh, Stephen says he was ready to pull down his pants if the judge had told him his ATP wasn't sufficient to convince him. Never got the chance. Justice Peltzi, so Mr. Turmel, did your template ask people to include a copy of their exemption? Turmel, no. It just said to include a copy of your authorization to possess number. Your license permit plate, I should have said. If I see your license permit plate, do I need to ask you to go look at, you know, I got your license. I didn't make them put copies of the ATPs out into them. I'm telling you this now. I didn't make them put the copies of the ATPs into the motion record, only the number because each exhibit would have needed to be sworn one at a time, and the non-lawyers doing their own often find that slow and confusing. Besides, they got the license plate. Crown has a computer. You know, why do they need to see the permit? Sad reason they not getting their meds that their affidavit is disbelieved because their uncontested testimony only showed the plate, not the permit. Justice tells you. Now, Mr. Turnell, surely you recognize that we're not the Department of Health. You gave us a number. We don't go to the Department of Health. But they do. And then they complain if they catch us doing a lie. But they didn't because everybody was valid. But you were talking to Phelan. You were asking Phelan to give you. He knew they were all valid at that point. He had already ascertained which ones had ATPs, which ones had not. Tells you, you're talking about list A, list B. Termel, yes. But I'm asking, I'm saying there's no reason you should have to see the license, I think he said permit, when you see the license plate to prove the guy is sick. In this case, the guy got an ATP. He qualified from Health Canada. Do you need to know whether it was AIDS or epilepsy? No, that's my point. It's none of the judge's business what they were sick with. All he had to know was that doctors had validated their illnesses to the satisfaction of Health Canada before. And suddenly they were all cut off by Justice Manson for non-medical reason to do with the financial viability of the MMAO, PPO. Now, since David Shea has died, since then, he's just one of the 120 who were stayed below. But if you extrapolate that to 18,000, that's like 150 expected dead people out there since they got their medications cut off. This is really a serious topic, and even the Court of Appeals sounded shocked that so many people could have been left out. And I'm saying, you have the power here to so simply just extend the remedy to the ones who got left out, like the ones who got put in. There's no logical reason unless you accept MMPR viability for cutting patients off their meds. And basically, those are the points. Justice Phelan made an error by not considering interim exemptions for personal medical use dismissing them with the unqualified ruling on the without limitation in Allard. He shouldn't have asked for the medical evidence when it wasn't his business to see what sickness you got, and you just got to know you're qualified. That's all you had to know. So on the basis, that basis, I've asked this court to overrule Judge Phelan's dismissal of the motions for personal medical use interim exemptions, and hopefully grant these people permanent ones, which you have the right to do, and you could do it for everybody, actually, and set this right. 18,000 people have been cut off for two years, struggling with expensive costs, and just let them get back to their little grow-ups for personal medical use, and 18,000 lives will possibly be in less jeopardy. Thank you, my lords, my lady. Thank you, Mr. Termel, Mr. Bricker. John Bricker, good afternoon. My colleague Andrea Wheeler is here with me today. There's really two parts in the appeal today. One, of course, is the, although these are framed as appeals from the June 4th and June 9th orders, I think they are in substance appeals from the May 7th decision, which stayed the plaintiff's actions. And also the June 4th order stayed the plaintiff's actions. 
and which confirmed that they were staged, but also more significantly dismissed their motions for interim relief. Subsequently, there was the July 9th amended order, which really was a clerical amendment to June 4th. And I don't think that amendment is in dispute at all today. And that gave, I should I can't talk now, so these are my comments. That gave us the chance for everybody to file appeals with the four who'd originally started. I'm going to, by them amending and giving us a new order to work with, I'm going to proceed in two parts. First of all, with respect to the decision to stay the actions, Justice Phelan was faced with what he himself described as an unprecedented situation with literally hundreds of self-represented plaintiffs whose claims had potential to consume vast judicial resources. In our submission, it was reasonable in those circumstances to stay the claims pending the Allard litigation, which raised very similar issues even if it solved none of ours, and sought virtually the identical relief, actually polar opposite, and had potential to simplify and eventually eliminate the need for these actions. That's silly. Once. To the motions for interim relief, what Justice Phelan found was that relief was already available. Oh, many of the plaintiffs were protected by the injunction issued in Allard, but they didn't like the conditions. Also, any plaintiff at all with medical approval has the recourse to the MMPR, which are the new regulations, which provides access to those with medical approval to marijuana from a commercial licensed producer at prices they can't afford, he'll always miss. What Justice Phelan found was that the plaintiff had failed to demonstrate why those two alternatives were insufficient. Well, guess what? The same reasons Judge Manson found the MMPR insufficient for the lucky 18,000 lucky permits he left alive, right? <laughs> uh, Bricker, and why they required a much broader relief. Hey, less broad relief than Allard asked for. That was sought in her motion, which was a wholesale exemption from the marijuana criminal law prohibitions when related to marijuana. Notice he forgot for personal medical use. In our submission, appellants haven't identified any error in those conclusions, let alone a palpable and overriding one, and for that reason, the decision should stand. Well, probably 150 dead former ATP holders, I bet. So I'll speak to the state first. I'm going to summarize Justice Phelan's analysis in paragraph 12. His conclusions that led him to issue a stay bar down to six points. First of all, he was faced with the hundreds of self-represented plaintiffs whose claims, he said, were difficult to coordinate. It was an unprecedented situation in that regard. Mm, you have to wonder why, they were, why it was hard when they were all the same. But the second point was that the claims raised issues and some relief was similar to those in the Allard litigation, which was much further advanced at that point. Yeah, by three months. And a decision in that case is expected soon. Yeah, my sick guys waited two years because they were more advanced and it's still not finished two years later and there's still appeals. Justice Peltier, Mr. Termel says in his materials that they're not seeking the same relief. Mr. Allard is seeking to preserve the MMAR. They're seeking to repeal it. John Bricker. Oh, a couple of responses to that. First, we need to distinguish between the issues and the relief. The relief sought is virtually identical repeal or extend <laughs> right after the judge tells him they're polar opposites <laughs> both claims are seeking as the ultimate relief permanent exemptions from the cdsa for all those medically approved notice he's not responding to the issue raised of the of opposite relief sought he jumps back to the interim exemption before the relief is adjudicated need a duck to question about opposite relief by just switching to something else. Now, in Allard, they're seeking some additional forms of relief as well. And if they ultimately get that, these claims in our submission go away completely. <laughs> Manson's already denied exemptions without limitation. Why suggest the Allards might win them now? In Manson, Conroy already lost Groves for the first 18,000. Lost the 150 gram limit. The only thing left for Phelan to decide is whether he cuts the last half off or not. Not quite making our cases go away completely. Lying. 
She asked a third time. As to the issues, Mr. Termel points out that there are some issues raised in his claims that are not in, raised in Allard. Most of those have to do with the MMAR. Jeez. Not most have to do with the MMAR 16 defects. Did he forget that most of them, 20 defects, have to do with the MMPR? Caught him lying again. Our response to that is twofold, even if there are unique issues. Allard still has the potential to resolve a number of issues, and for that reason alone should proceed. Secondly, the MMAR, which are unique issues raised in these claims, have been repealed. So there's no challenge available to those regulations anymore. They don't exist. Some of the limits previously issued under the MMAR have been preserved in the course of the injunction issued in the Allied litigation, but the regulations themselves are gone. But 18,000 people are still forced to live under these regulations that are gone. We should be able to challenge them while they affect people. Those aspects of the claims are completely moot. There's nothing left to challenge. And aren't they lucky for them they installed me until the MMAR lapsed? Or we might have had a condemnation of them. But Phelan saved the MMAR from the dirt it deserves. Pelchie, explain to me which of the issues raised by these appellants will be disposed of by a successful appeal. <laughs> and here, of course, he's got to mention the four. That's all he's got. we got 16 extras. Mr. Termel said it's only four out of 20. It's actually a lot more than that. Still always 16 different. We list all of them at paragraph 30 of our factor. Starting with the second sentence, we say, in particular, it's alleged in both the Allard and Termel quit claims and go on to list the various points of overlap. Both claims suggest, well, we wrote it down if it's there, there should be a right to personal production of marijuana. Well, yeah, of course it is. To outdoor production. Oh, so challenging the prohibition on growing becomes two issues. Challenging the prohibition on outdoor growing and the suggestion of challenging the prohibition on growing. Lying to dream up two flaws out of one, but those two are really still only one. They both raise the issue of the commercial licensed producers that were established under the new regulations might not be able to keep up with demand. We argued the regime could not meet the numbers, and since the Allards didn't have the map, they could not argue that. Conroy argued they may not, but did not raise it as a ground in their statement of claim. It's in ours, not theirs. Check it out. So that one's false. They both also raise the same concerns about affordability of marijuana from licensed producers. Non-affordability is not in the Allard Statement of Claim, but it is in ours. Another false one. They also both raise the issue of whether they'll be able to access different strains. Ditto, in ours, not theirs. No matter how much they jawed about it and talked about different strains, that's again false. Nowhere in their notice is it there. Another issue, and this one's been resolved by the Supreme Court, both claims raised the MMPR only provided access to dried marijuana and not other forms that would allow them to develop things like edibles, topical oils. That's raised in both claims. But just this past summer, the Supreme Court's decided the Smith case on that issue. And that issue is now moot in both Allard and those claims. Okay, so that one we won. And that's one out of the ten common ones only. We still got nine common bad ones left. They think they're gone. So we won. We proved the MMPR had failed. Except I had asked for repeal by Bino. Bad exemption means no offense. And Conroy did not. Except at the last moment when they tried to sneak straight marijuana off Schedule 2 at the last moment into their documentation to which the Crown objected. It wasn't in their statement of claim. But we've won our first round that should have cost federal court to declare repeal before the criminal courts will soon now do. Lucky for the Crown, our motions for Bino were stayed. Repeal by Bino. Both the Allard and Termel kit claims challenge the 150 gram limit on possession. Conroy's challenge to the 150 gram as unreasonable is lost. Johnny Engineer Termel's uh, challenge as based on fraudulent surveys remains stayed. But Thalen knows about the fraud, and he has to pretend he doesn't when he signs off. So all those are squarely raised. 
Well, actually, most of those were not raised at all. No matter how many other things he thinks seem alike to be counted as grounds of complaint, there have always to be 16 we raised they did not. <laughs> Though trying to fantasize up the number, just looking at the Allard statement of claim belies the Crown's words. <laughs> anyway, but we also see Allard had the potential to clarify some of the unique issues in these claims. So resolving 4 out of 20 has no potential to clarify the other 16 out of 20. They're all different torts. A lot of unique issues, Mr. Termal describes them, relate to things like affordability, which they didn't raise, and availability of preferred strains, which they didn't raise. Allard, even if it doesn't raise those, and frame them in the same way, how can they raise them, frame them when they didn't raise them, has huge potential to clarify them. And again, right, they didn't raise those. But those issues they didn't raise have potential huge to clarify those issues they didn't raise. <laughs> it's just too funny. And how could they have been framed differently if they weren't even raised? All right, JB. Ah, did I skip too far? Yeah, there it is. And I would go one step further. Allard, one of the forms of relief being sought as a personal, is an exemption from the CDSA for all persons in Canada medically approved. <laughs> which has already been denied below and can't be overruled below, <laughs> and which we only are now appealing above. Think about that. He's saying that if they win what they lost, things will be better for us. <laughs> we'll see what the federal court does with that. Phelan can't vary Manson's decision to cut half off. So this is a ball-faced lie. It'll have no effect on our left outs at all. Just constant lying to pretend he doesn't know or forgot exemptions without limitations has already been lost. Maybe he's hoping the court will also forget, since I told him a couple of times. But if the Allard plaintiffs are successful on that point, which is already lost, these claims would go away almost entirely, which they can't. That's the same relief being sought here. Without limitation is the same relief as personal medical use sought here. Of course, Conroy can't get the exemptions without limitation and can't help the left outs no matter how much lawyer the Crown does again. There are a few plaintiffs who actually challenge the requirement and say they should not have to get a doctor's approval. Well, that's me and Shane Hollenwright, two of us. That's been considered and decided, and that argument has been rejected in a number of cases. We have the Hitzig case and more recently Smith. In one of the conditions, the finding I suppose the remedy was a declaration of invalidity to the extent that the laws affect, uh, affect I should put affecting, yeah, to the laws affecting those with medical marijuana approval. So that physician approval requirement's always been consistently upheld, and subject to that, Allard has the potential to make these claims go away in their retirement. Yeah, for me and Shane. <laughs> Recalcitrant doctors is not a ground of Allard. They represent people who all have doctors, want their MMARs extended. It's ours, people who can't get doctors to sign too. So how can he say the Allard case that says nothing about recalcitrant doctors has the potential to make our case against recalcitrant doctors go away? Incoherent lying at that. <laughs> hasn't he, okay, hasn't he clicked that these are people left out of Allard which has zero potential to make their problems go away. By constant lying has hypnotic effect. John may believe it himself after repeating it so many times. Or does he know he's lying? As for that reason alone, he says, we submit that it's worth having the Allard King case claim proceed and staying these claims. No matter how many left outs die while waiting, there's the reduction of issues. And with the reduction comes a considerable saving in the terms of judicial resources. And going back to my six points, the last two are that Justice Phelan found, in the meantime, while the actions were stayed, that the plaintiffs would have what he considered to have sufficient access. First of all, those covered in the Allard injunction would get the full benefit of it and would continue to protest in accordance with their permits. And those not protected by the Allard injunction, he repeats, Phelan said, well, I'm going to let you proceed with your own motions for interim relief, and I'll consider those. 
and those were in the June 4th decision, which I'll come to and which is under appeal. I was going to highlight for you the points of overlap with Allard. I've already done that now. By bringing up topics the Allards did not raise. And it's far more significant than Mr. Termel has suggested. I only said we had 16 MMPR issues the Allards had not raised. And he's shown nothing to disprove that. There are some differences. The MMAR issue, which means they are essentially moot at this point. But even if there are some differences that remain as between the claims, 16, even if the Al even if Allard manages to resolve only some of the issues in these proceedings, the stay will have been worth it. Well, not worth it to David Shea and all the others who died while our actions for repeal are stayed. We've included in our authorities the Coot case, Justice Stratus, this is your decision, in paragraph 8, you refer to section 50, that's the authority to issue stays. You talk about how a stay, this is not a stay of another body's proceedings, this is the federal court staying its own proceedings. I liken that to a decision to adjourn. This is the court controlling its own process, except this one ends up with corpses at the end of the decision. And the factors to be considered there are really broad, discretionary factors. In paragraph 12, you say that the stay depends on the factual circumstances presented to the court. That's why I like laying out corpses. And to the factors be considered that there are really broad discretion. Oh, uh, uh, guided by certain principles, these principles include securing a just, most expeditious, and least expensive determination of a proceeding on its merits. Judicial principles guide us in the exercise of plenary jurisdiction to manage proceedings as long as no party is unfairly prejudiced and it is in the interest of justice for these considerations. This court should exercise its discretion against the wasteful use of judicial resources, the public purse, and taxpayers who fund it deserve respect. As well, cases are interconnected. One case sits alongside hundreds of other cases, and devoting resources to one for no good reason depriving the others for no good reason. I see death is pretty prejudiced. Now, in this case, as Justice Kalin said, the court was faced with literally hundreds of claims back to the no money, that were difficult to coordinate, yeah, to a low-tech judge. These had the potential to consume vast amounts of resources, yeah, again, again, again. Uh, if the other litigation can conserve even just some of those resources by resolving the common issues, it would have been worthwhile. Not worthwhile, wait to wait for those deprived of their medicine for two years, some unto death. As I said, it has potential to not only resolve the issue if the relief in Allard is granted, it could make these claims go away in their entirety. What is that? Five times he repeats that even though it has no effect? Four or five times? Forgetting Allard offers nothing to the left outs when Phelan can't change Manson's order. But repetition might hypnotize the court into faking a dunk. GB, in those circumstances, we say it was eminently reasonable to put these claims on temporary hold, pending the Allard litigation. Two years is temporary, you know, when it does not help left outs at all. With respect to the motions for interim relief, I suppose the two overlap a little bit because one consideration in the state decision is whether the plaintiffs will be prejudiced while waiting while their matters are stayed. Was David Shea prejudiced by not having access to his prescribed medicine while waiting, while his matter was stayed? And I think the real central issue with respect to prejudice in this case is whether they would have access to medical marijuana, provided there was a medical need. And that's also the same issue that comes up with respect to their motions. Those were decided on June 4th. I think the key point here was not the situation where the plaintiffs had no access whatsoever. As I said 12 times before, and Justice Phelan noted, many of them had the benefit of the Allard injunction with preserve certain licenses, blah, 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 blah. Second, they could have gone to the MMA. Yeah, we know, we know, we know. Clearly, the appellants are not satisfied with these two regimes. Do you notice the reputation when they got no case? Or cannot afford, he keeps forgetting that option. And feel they need a much broader relief in the form of a complete exemption from the criminal laws. That's what we want. Not from the MMAR regulation. He doesn't know that. Notice he failed to add the personal medical use qualifier, of course. Wonder if the court noticed. Justice Phelan has two responses to that. The first, he said the exemption requested was overly broad. Yes, he found personal medical use overly broad when all previous courts had found it just ideal. 
<laughs> or he confused ours with the overly broad Conroy exemption without limitation. Yeah, that could have been confusion too. Paragraph 21, he actually quotes from Justice Manson because the exact same form of relief has been sought in the adult exemption injunction. Without limitation is the exact same form of relief as personal medical use. Exact. Lying again. Justice Manson said, no, I missed it. The first form of relief requested by the applicant is a constitutional exemption that exempts medically approved patients and their, and their designates from possession, trafficking, and possession for the purpose of production in the CDSA without qualification. It is not the intent of the MMAR to define the circumstances under which medically approved patients can possess and grow marijuana. The relief sought of interim exemptions from the provisions of the CDSA without limitation. In paragraph 22, Justice Phelan expresses agreement with that statement, says that the request an exemption is not tailored to remedying an alleged charter violation that appears essentially unlimited. Justice Peltzi, well, you heard Mr. Turmel saying that contrary to the position the Allards took, his group takes the position that they want an exemption for personal medical use. And there actually is. I might need a few minutes to find it. There's a very similar language in the Allard Notice of Motion, which was tailored to medical need. So there is a similar proviso there. Peltier, well, if that's the case, then Justice Manson's language is too broad in paragraph 21. It makes no mention of a personal medical use proviso. Good point, I'd missed it. If there was a proviso somewhere in the notice of motion about limiting their use, then how could Manson have determined it was without limitation if there'd been such a proviso? <laughs> there cannot be such a limiting proviso or Judge Manson was overbroad in calling it without limitation. No one in the courtroom realized how the judge had caught him in a contradiction. Not even me. JB, right. That's right. If there was such proviso, Manson's language was too broad in dubbing it without limitation. Bricker, so what Justice Manson, I might try to find that in the notice of motion, and I might need a couple of minutes. Well, you take a few minutes, take a few hours to try to find what ain't there. <laughs> Wonder how he ducks out of this one. But when he talks about the motion, I heard noise, I think that's in reference to the previous regulations, which... He said, where he says, the previous regulations under which medically mar approved marijuana patients possess and grow marijuana in large quantities. I think Mr. Turmel seems to think that the Allard plaintiffs, as he said, were seeking an exemption that would allow them to sell marijuana to children. I mean, that's it's it's Justice Peltier, Mr. Turmel has a pension for hyperbole. Yes, I'm good at taking it to the limit. Selling it to the kids is the hyperbole of what they could do. Legit hyperbole. Uh, Bricker, I tend to agree, but what Justice Manson and Phelan were referring to was lack of any limitations, where the fact that, first of all, the exemption sought both in Allard in this case, the plaintiffs wanted an exemption that would not require them to see, seek any medical approval. Come on, all the Allards did not seek an exemption without medical approval. I, healthy me, did. Besides, what does doctor approval have to do with the limitations with respect to the criminal code? It's with, without limitation to the criminal code, the judge said. Can traffic to kids limitation is suddenly linked to doctors? It's limitations on what you can do and not do in the CDSA, not on how you get the right to that relief in the MMAR. They all had it. Half were denied. But in seeking to extend the MMAR, the Allards certainly were challenging. The, we're not challenging the doctor requirement. It's one of our torts, not theirs. And because we have people with epilepsy who've been told no. Bricker, some of them had medical approval previously, but under the old and new regulations, there's a requirement that that be renewed annually. And that is not part of the exemption. So there's no something sought. So there's no limitation in that sense. The exemption that they're seeking doesn't have any restrictions either on where or how they can grow. Right. 
As long as it's for personal medical use, their exemption lets them move, change designated growers, anything they want, as long as they don't break the CDSA. Nor how much they can possess. Actually, everyone is willing to live with the restrictions in their pen permits, as long as they can change them. Is there something wrong with banking 10 years worth until the day you can't grow yourself anymore? Growing enough in one season for 10 years in the bank? Actually, nor yet. Yeah. Those, those are the key features of the regime that the plaintiff, and I'll come to that, Justice Phelan's next concern in a moment, the plaintiffs have put little for it and no evidence about those limita why those limitations were problematic. Well, that's because it's exemption to prohibition for personal medical use in the CDSA that's being discussed, not exemption to grow rules in the MMAR. MMAR considerations under a dead regime are now mooted. They're gone, as he repeated, and weren't even there when Terry Parker, three times, abided with the exemptions for personal medical use without those regulations on how he grew. Without limitation had to do with exemption to provisions in the CDSA, not exemption to limit the number of plants. But they didn't explain why they needed such a broad and limitless exemption as the one being sought. Well, what other explanation than Manson that cut them off, so it was the only remedy they had? So when he talks about the lack of limits, what he means was no limits on how much, how much can be possessed, where it can be grown, how much it can be grown. And we say without limitation with respect to offending the criminal code. And he says it's without limitation to grow to MMAR growing parameters. <laughs> but interim exemption discussion was about the protection from the criminal code, not from plant limits. But what a wild goose to get away from the original issue. With no requirement for medical approval for patients who've already got it. And that is true of both the exemptions sought by the Allards, but denied by Justice Manson, and the exemptions sought here. Well, maybe he thinks Justice Pelletier already forgot his own question about them not being the same. Justice Phelan then devotes several paragraphs of noise to talk about constitutional exemptions and to point out that's an exceptional remedy. Well, not so exceptional since Parker got three. It's the only remedy ever used before. Exceptional is lowering again when it's the standard. I should point out that remedy has also been rejected by this court. Four of the appellants in this consolidated appeals brought motions, again, for interim exemptions from the CDSA pending these appeals that we're hearing today. Terry Parker, Rachel Mal, Stephen Burroughs, Robert Roy. And all four of those were dismissed, and leave applications to the Supreme Court were also dismissed. Mr. Termal did refer to a case where exemptions were granted, the Parker case. We address it in our factum. It's addressed by Justice Phelan, paragraphs 24 to 26. In essence, what Justice Phelan says, and we completely agree, is that the exemption was issued in circumstances where there were no alternatives at that point in time available to them for access to medical marijuana, unlike now, when there are regimes in place. That exemption was granted after a trial in which the court had found the existing regime to be unconstitutional, and we don't have that here. Well, only in 1997, by his 2000 constitutional exemption, there were Section 56 exemptions. And by his 2003 exemption, they had the MMAR. So, two-thirds were granted while such access existed. And still, exemption for personal medical use was the way they chose to go. But did you expect the Crown to check to make sure they weren't loyal to the court? Imagine that Terry Parker, the Terry Parker, who should have been exempted first, never even qualified. Doctor would never sign. Well, they're seeking that right on an interlocutory basis where there's been no trial, no examination of the issues, and the current regime, and how it affects the patients. So Justice Phelan's first concern was the nature of the relief being sought. His second concern was really one about evidence. He says essentially that while some plaintiffs had provided evidence about medical circumstances, they provided little to no detail about why the existing avenues, being the Allard Injunction and the MMPR, were insufficient. Hey! Whatever the reasons those who got the Allard injunction needed it, then they're the same now. Whatever the reasons those who didn't get have. So Peltier as paragraph 28, yeah. Paragraph 28 talks about the lack of evidence. Last line, paragraph 23 says, 
Perhaps, most importantly, the claimants have failed to establish at this time that the medical exemption provided by the MMAR or MMPR violates their rights in a way that would be remedied by a constitutional exemption. They just weren't able to convince them their rights were being violated by not getting their meds. Oh. So it's not so much, I think Mr. Jamal suggested that Justice Phelan question medical need. He actually does do that with respect to one plaintiff. He notes some plaintiffs are seeking marijuana not for an ex existing medical condition, but for preventative reasons. And he says, I'm not satisfied that that is a recognized use. And that's consistent also with the Hitzig case. But with respect to the other uh, plaintiffs, oh, and Hitzig, the court also told me that too. He, I was there. He doesn't question medical need. And in fact, he recognizes in several places that some of them have, many of the plaintiffs have demonstrable medical need. Oh, isn't that nice? Phelan J recognizes demonstrable, me, demonstrable medical need, and they don't give them their medicine back. For the record, here's the affidavit everyone used with what I thought sufficient information to confirm medical need that Phelan found so insufficient. I, affiant, residing at this address, make oath as follows. I hereby attest I wish to use mar cannabis marijuana for medical purposes. You can tick off to prevent illness. It's good for before getting it. That's me in a chain. Tick off for suffering from the following illnesses for which I have medical documentation or medical permits and for the drugs I've been prescribed which have proven to be not as effective as cannabis for my particular treatment. And there's lists there. They didn't have to tell him what they were sick was, so he turned guys down with brain cancer. If applicable, authorization to possess number, personal use production license number, designated grower license number, your plant limit, divide that by five, you got your grams per day, stored grams limit, that too is a function of grams per day, and three, I claim damages for the destruction of my stored grams at 12 bucks a gram, my number of plants at a thousand bucks, and the site value for a total of this number. So Phelan had their sworn illnesses, sworn previous treatments, ATP, PUPL, DPL, my numbers, plant limit divided by five is daily prescription, stored limit also based on daily prescription, and claim for damages for shutting them down with no affordable alternative. Remember, an affidavit is to be believed if opposition says nothing. All sworn information was there, so what did judge really need to know more? That's what Phelan had before him. Patients prohibited from possessing the medicine they had permits to grow. But what he questions and what he finds was insufficient, evidence of, evidence as to why the existing two regimes, the Allard injunction and then the MNPR, were incapable of meeting that medical need that had been established, says Brenner. Well, it makes me want to puke every time you suggest they can always go buy high-priced product from Health Canada suppliers. Never mention they can't afford it. Just forget prices quadruple, quintuple, with tax, with courier delivery. They're all so rich. It's all so affordable. Maybe the Allards were well off. But most exempties are not. But then again, that's lying, always half-truths. They could have, if they had the money. Bricker, there was a reference in paragraph 28 of Justice Phelan's decision, Mr. Jamel asked, why did Justice Phelan need to see people's authorizations to possess? What I think Justice Phelan was getting at there, both the MMAR and MMPR required that you go back to your doctor every year to renew the medical approval. Well, the 18,000 let-ins by Manson don't have to anymore, do they? And generally, physicians as gatekeepers to the system, that's been recognized and upheld by the courts in other cases. Gatekeepers who don't open the gates. But if it was not important for the let-ins, why should it be important for the left out? What I think Justice Finn was getting at there, there was no way to tell just by looking at someone's ATP number whether their authorization was current. I don't know what he means by current. We all know that half of them were knocked out. Okay? Does he mean current? I mean, they can tell by the grow permits were current. Just got to look at the computer. It's clear that many of the plaintiffs had been authorized at one time by Health Canada to possess marijuana, but it wasn't clear whether that was current. It wasn't clear they could look at the dates, but it wasn't current to these lawyers. Whether they currently recognize as having medical need. Well, everyone had their grow parents recognized. 
and left out to ask them to have their matching possessed permits recognized too, like the Lorenz did. That's all. Jeez. Ugly. Mr. Turmel also referred to the category of plaintiffs whom he referred to as leftouts, those who had permits under the old regulation, but for one reason or another are not covered in the allowed injunction. Actually, it's those who had valid grow permits left out. Allard, okay. Either their permits expired before the specified date in the Allard border, or because they moved, their permits are tied to a particular address. <clears throat> and that issue was, as Mr. Termel alluded to, and I'm going to clarify, was very specifically considered in Allard. There are four plaintiffs in Allard, and what Justice Manson said was that those with permits that were valid on particular dates have those permits preserved. And again, no explanation why those dates were relevant. Two of the Allard plaintiffs, though, had permits at one time. They had expired before those dates. So as a result, they did not have the benefit of the Allard injunction. Now, they didn't expire before those dates. They expired before those date, one date. Their grow is still alive. But say dates, just a little bit of lying also. Okay. Um, now, the Allard plaintiffs appeal specifically raised that issue. When it came before this court, this court said essentially, we're not clear on why Justice Manson didn't include those two plaintiffs and why they'd been left out of the regime and sent it back for clarification. Justice Manson essentially confirms that his intention indeed was to provide, extend the Allard injunction only to some plaintiffs and not to those whose permits had expired before the date specified in the order, whose permit had expired with their other ones still alive before the date in the order. Her permit. But add the S to do a little lying. It says in paragraph 3, I specifically chose the relative transitional dates of September 30th and March 21st to limit the availability of the injunctive relief to extend only to those who held valid licenses to possess and produce marijuana for medical purposes as of those dates. And in a sense, that's not true because he extended the produce to everybody. Oh, I did say those dates and I didn't mention them, how they fit. Okay. That's all the evidence you'll need for a genocide indictment, though. He did it on purpose, based on dates, not medical information. In paragraph 5, he elaborates on why he included that limit. In considering the balance of convenience, the remedy I granted was intended to avoid unduly impacting the viability of the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulations, MMPR, and to take into consideration the practical implications of the MMAR regime no longer being enforced. What he's referring to there, two distinct points, in terms of the viability of the MMPR, there was a great deal of evidence in the original Allard injunction motion about what would happen if the injunction was granted, and there was a concern that enough people were to continue producing their own marijuana under the old regulations, that would take away a significant part of the customer base that the licensed producers under the new regulations had been counting on, and their viability would be undermined. With an estimated million users, 36,000 self-growers would only take away 4% of the market. Not quite significant. They only had 96% of the market, and Manson cutting half off now gives them 98% of the market, with dates as the cutoff parameter. Bricker and people who had come to rely on those licensed producers for their medicine would potentially lose. That was the concern about the viability of that regime. And how do people relying on those LPs lose when LPs don't get the last 4% to buy from them too? He also talks about the practical implications of the MMAR licensing regime no longer being enforced. There was evidence in the original injunction motion that the MMAR regime had, at that point, been largely, if not entirely, dismantled. And what was being sought, basically, to give individuals whose permits had expired to extend those permits would require re-establishing a regime that had already been dismantled at that point. So how can the regime still be working for the 18,000 left in and could not work for the 18,000 who want back in? Get it? It's already set up for the first, why not the second half? He found that the balance of convenience did not favor extending the injunction that broadly to everyone. He didn't say everyone. Just one point of clarification. Mr. Jamel also referred to David Shea and his factum as well. 
whom he says has passed away. And I think Mr. Turmel suggests that this was because his motion for interim relief was denied by Justice Bailey. Here's exactly what I said. Since then, David Chase died. He's one of the 120 who were stayed below. I didn't say he was one of the 26 who filed motions for an interim exemption of pay. In the fifth, I said he was one of the 300 who filed motions for permanent exemptions or repeals below. But had I said motions, then the Crown's continued accusations would be true. Mr. Shea didn't bring a motion for relief. Agreed. I never said he did. He had. He brought a statement of claim like 300 others was fairly boilerplate, asking for a permanent exemption that got stalled. There was no evidence about his personal circumstances. None of this was before Justice Bailey, so there's no interim exemption before Justice Bailey for Justice Bailey to consider. Doesn't mean the stayed guy for permanent exemption, I didn't say that, didn't die, though he had not listed his cancer in his statement of claim. But he may have been saved had his action not been stayed. Frickert, to suggest that the court is somehow responsible for Shea's death, it's inaccurate in the extreme. Hey, I suggest the Crown attorneys who've argued he shouldn't have an exemption are just as responsible. We do raise a, a preliminary issues in our factum, a technical point I don't propose to say anything more about unless it is the court has questions. Stratus, J.A., I have one question about it. It ultimately does not dispose of the whole case because the list of moving parties is different for each of May and June. So the point would apply to bar those who are party to the May order, but not fresh people to the June order. Bricker, it's narrower than that, although you're right that it's not everyone. The state that was issued on May 7th, nobody appealed that. And as far as we're concerned, that it's not properly before this Court of Appeal. The implication being that those moving parties will be barred from relitigating. He means barred from appealing late. We were the moving party with respect to the stay. Because nobody appealed that original stay decision, we say that you can't do indirectly by now appealing from the confirmation decision in the previous decision. With respect to the plaintiff's motions for interim relief, those were decided in the June 4th order. And four of the appellants have appealed that within the prescribed deadline, timeline for doing so. Uh, Terry, Ray, Stephen, and Robert on that. So with respect to the motion for interim relief, those four appeals are proper. The other 22 appeals, though, were from the July 9th amended order. And we don't take any issue with that amendment. In substance, they're really directed at the original decision that was an appeal. It's something technical, but it's important, and we felt the need. But of course, Justice Phelan's decision, and I missed that noise. Those are my submissions. I'm prepared to speak the costs and have the bill of costs as well. Peltier, why don't you make your submissions on costs now? We're seeking 2,600 in disbursements, about $100 per appeal, um, plus disbursements. And uh, I think for 26 appeals, it includes our bringing of the consolidation motion. It includes preparation of the appeal book and the authorities. Those are responsibilities in this case to undertake them. And Mr. Tumel's agreed to bear any cost in the consolidated appeal. We agree that's an appropriate order and he bear these costs. We don't see any reason to depart from the general rule of cost in the cause. I would also point out that this court has issued several costs considered in these cases already. Several appellants there was a previous round of appeals as well in which several appellants brought motions for interim relief. Four also sought those motions in these appeals. And in each of those cases, the court has ordered each appellant to pay $500 in cost. We submit that as equally appropriate here. Thank you very much for your question. Peltier, tell me again where I can find Mr. Turmel's agreement to bear these costs. Volume 2. Thank you very much. Mr. Turmel, your reply, you know what that means, don't you? Yes, yes, I'm just going to rebut the points that were raised and weren't done before. He said most of our extras deal with the MMAR. Well, there are ten flaws common to both regimes. Six alone to the MMAR and ten new ones alone to the MMPR. So it's not fair to say that most of our extras deal with the MMAR when the Allard case dealt with four MMPR flaws and we had a total of 20. Now, how can they try to argue it's more than 4 and 20 when they got 20 fingers and toes to help them? And it's always a 16-digit difference, I should say. 
Turmel, the fact we had 16 MMAR flaws is irrelevant. The fact we had 20 MMPR flaws compared to the significant four complaints by Allard. When he said the Allard decision could make our claims go away in their entirety. Well, it's pretty tough to imagine how settling four out of 20 would do that. I'll just leave that at that. Gee, you guys will say anything. The overlap with the Allards is insignificant. Wrong use of the word. Four out of 20 is not what scientists would consider significant overlap. As for resolving the issue, what's needed is that against our statement of claim of 20 flaws, no statement of defense. And against the Allard statement of claim with four flaws, massively prepared statement of defense. And they're telling everybody how this is a great case fought over by a great lawyer and there's all this evidence before the court. Yeah, to the four mini torts they can handle, but what are they going to do about LPs saying, we're cutting you off for a business reason? So they have not dealt with the majority of the flaws at all. So they haven't even filed a statement of defense. And that's why I kind of wondered how they have a right to make a motion to stay when they hadn't even filed a statement of defense. Doesn't that seem a little unusual? But anyway, they couldn't file a statement of defense. And they did against Allard which is obviously why they're happy to be fighting Allard, not me. He said, we're the ones asking for the overly broad exemption. And he said, it's the exact same. Well, you know the difference between without limitation and personal medical use. So I don't want to go there again. He said that it's broad, that it's limitless. It needs no medical approval. Every one of those people had an ATP, had medical approval. I'm not looking for this for people who don't have medical approval. That was a silly exaggeration. Well, actually, they're, you know, the epileptics who don't. And, well, they do have medical approval. No, they don't. Couldn't find a doctor. But they have proof of illness. Stratus, at this point, I'd really be interested in your response to this. His point is that the mere fact you have that number doesn't mean you're in good standing because it has to be renewed or redone. Your number would prove you were an authorized user at some point in the past. But isn't that proof? Isn't, is that proof that today isn't proof that today you're an authorized user? Termel, none of them were. They were cut off. You can look at the date of their exemption. Robert Roy, March 18. Well, there's proof he wasn't extended. So there's no question they were cut off. They don't have exemptions anymore. But their medical status may have, I think your friend's point is, Termel, Medical condition changed in six months? Six months? Like this ain't four years later. This is within recent history when they stopped and expired to see what happens. So I don't think that's a very good argument when you consider how short a time it was. Maximum six months. That's all I can answer. The time limit was so short that they really didn't have that opportunity. He said we asked for an interim exemption with no evidence. Wait a minute now. Justice Manson extended the exemption. He did it. Why can't we ask to have the same? It's like saying what he did before you can't ask for. Why? He did it before. We want the same thing. That's all. If it was enough for Manson on the medical evidence he had for 18,000 of the people, why wasn't it enough for the other 18,000 of the people? Medical evidence wasn't an issue, I should say. Okay, the practical implications of keeping the MMPR going. For 30,000 people, you wouldn't need too many people to have a bureaucracy to upgrade. We're talking about 10 to $15 million after estimated costs for the program. Pelchi asked, do you mean MMAR or MMPR? MMAR, either one. You need staff to handle it, and they're both around 30,000 or 40,000 right now. Pelchi agreed, hey, the MMAR is up and running. The MMAR has been... MMPR is up and running. MMAR has been dismantled. You're talking about putting it back up? Well, no. How much do you have to put up is the question. They're going to spend 60,000 million, 60 billion on warplanes. And they can't afford 15 million to update the books on medical people. Besides, the only reason for the need for the updating of the database is for address changes and designated grower changes. My brother's not going to change his anything for years. And that's another thing, too, about the yearly renewals. Guess what? Everybody who has the benefit of Manson's decision doesn't need yearly renewals anymore. We're still under the old MMAR. 
but without the yearly renewals. So there's nothing wrong with permanently sick people not needing yearly renewals. And the Manson decision has afforded that benefit to them already. And finally, David Shea. David Shea had an action for a permanent exemption or repeal of the laws, like we all did. And his action is one of the ones that were stained by failing Shea. He was too sick in a hospital at the time to file a motion for an interim exemption to the Court of Appeal, having been denied, or the lower court of the 50, with everybody else, any relief below. I didn't say it was his motion for an interim exemption, which had been refused. Oh, but we ha had we been allowed to go forward with our action, he might have his medicine. So, that's all I meant to say. I know there are others out there, and I would bet that there are others out there who, not in my group of people who appealed, but it doesn't mean there weren't another hundred people who did not appeal out of the 18,000 who didn't even do the actions. My point was simply to stress the fact I've had a personal friend who succumbed to his brain cancer when the prohibition or what killed him. And he had a motion for repeal of those prohibitions or for an exemption to use marijuana in any way he wanted. So I didn't mean to mislead, and I am certainly right that David Shea's action for relief was stayed at the time. Now, the MMAR extension, I didn't say, not good enough because he couldn't use oil. Only repeal or an exemption could save him. And there will be more people who are going to suffer if you guys, if my lords, do not correct this problem. Like I said, I'm healthy. I want it for neurogenesis, brain cell development, and for the benefits and prevention. And honestly, that should be acknowledged finally. Why should I have to wait until I'm sick before I can use what's good for everybody else who's already got it? All right, me, my brother, Terry, the left outs, and the address changes are all covered. They all need their medicine back, and your Court of Appeal found the decision to cut them off not only unusual, but unfathomable, and I hope it remains that way. Thank you. Justice Stratus, can I ask you one question? We asked the Crown Council about costs on two, okay, on two scenarios, one if you're successful, the other if you're unsuccessful. Terminal. Well, if I'm successful, I know not being a lawyer, I really can't claim much. So it doesn't matter. I wouldn't want costs. If we're unsuccessful, I really cannot complain about a reasonable bill like that. I just hope that it can somehow be written off and stuck to them simply on the basis of good nature. And we're trying to help the poor people who don't want me to have to suffer the whole bill. Thank you. Tell TJ, thank you, Mr. Termel. Thank you both for your able submissions, your energy, Mr. Termel. We will take the matter under reserve, and we will provide you with written reasons in due course. Thank you. So, no one yet knows why Manson picked March 21st as cutoff, do we? Just that he did, and that's not a law. Nope. So, we're facing people who are going to die because Manson said so. Period. No reason at all for the anguish and death. So my only regret is missing the point that M Manson extended all grow permits expired or not, but then did not extend all possessed permits expired or not. So what was it about being expired that didn't matter with respect to the grow permit, but that did matter with respect to the possessed permits? I could have asked. Unless Manson J knew the possessed permits were needed for the grow permits. And it sounds like something was extended to the group that really didn't, wasn't. Next, the decision. So now the decision. This is my first time reading it too. Federal Court of Appeal, docket A34214, citation 216 FCA 9, date 2016 -0113. Coram, Peltier, Stratas, and Gleason, all J.A., between John Termel, appellant, and Her Majesty the Queen, respondent. And, of course, I'm the lead appellant in a consolidated case for 26 appellants out of 50 people who applied for motions below before Justice Phelan for interim exemptions, out of 300 people who filed applications for repeal and for permanent exemptions below the 26th. Stratus wrote the reasons for judgment. One, before the court are 26 appeals. Four appellants appeal an order dated June 4th, 2014. <coughs> and another 22 appellants appeal an amended order dated July 9th, 2014. 
So them amending the order let the other 22 people in. All orders were made by the federal court per Phelan J. Uh, 2014 FC 537. This court has ordered that the appeals be consolidated. These are the reasons in the consolidated appeal. A copy of these reasons shall be placed in each appeal file. The pending challenges against marijuana regulations. The appellants in this court, self-represented litigants, acting along with other self-represented litigants, have challenged the constitutionality of the Marijuana Medical Access Regulations and the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulations in the federal court. In all, there are roughly 300 virtually identical challenges. The constitutionality of the MMPR is also an issue before the federal court in Allard et al. versus Her Majesty the Queen, T. 2013-13. Interlocutory proceedings. Five. On May 7th, in response to a motion brought by the respondent, the federal court exercised its discretion in favor of staying the challenges brought by all of the self-represented litigants on the ground that the Allard challenge was much further advanced and had significant potential to reduce the issues in play, clarifying those remaining, potentially simplify the litigation for the lay litigants, and save judicial resources. In granting the stay, the federal court noted the unprecedented situation of hundreds of lay litigants whose claims were difficult to realistically co coordinate the May 7th order was not appealed. A large number of matters brought by the self-represented litigants in federal court arises because the lead litigant, Mr. Turmel, created templates for litigation documents and made them available on the internet. In the case of the motions that led to the June 4th, 2014 order now under appeal, the appellants made use of one of these templates to prepare their affidavits in support of their motions. The template was limited. It allowed them to state their medical condition without any other supporting detail or evidence. It allowed them to insert the number of their authorization to possess certificate, a certificate granted on the basis of medical conditions sometime in the past, in the past six months. Um, actually, it allowed them uh, without, okay. Seven, in the June 4th order under appeal, the federal court exercised its discretion to dismiss motions by the appellants for interim constitutional exemptions from the CDSA pending trial of the challenges, not from the MMAR, as the Crown tried to say. In July, the July 9th, 2014 amended order, the federal court clarified that the May 7th, 2014 stay would remain in place until all appeals in the Allard challenge have been exhausted which means they've wasted two years now and they get to waste another two more years while more people sit there and wait for relief for them that doesn't help my people at all. See the specific issues in these appeals. Despite this procedural complexity, there are only two issues raised by these appeals. We must decide whether the federal court committed reviewable error in staying the challenges until the final disposition of the Allard challenge and dismissing the motions for interim constitutional exemption from the CDSA for personal medical use, he could have put. D, the standard of review. The federal court judge who determined these matters did so as a case management judge. The order made is interlocutory, discretionary one, based on applying legal standards to factual findings based on the evidence before him. If such an order is prompted by an error of law or legal principle, an appellant court must intervene. Short of that sort or of error, an appellant court must defer to the motion judge's assessment. This is especially so when the order is a case management order. Oh, man. Can't get their meds back. Over the years, this court and the Supreme Court have used different words to describe the level of deference that must be shown, or put another way, the point at which a court can intervene in the absence of error of law or legal principle. And we're saying the section that says a judge can do anything that is just can put a stop to people dying. The cases speak of clear error, misapprehension of facts, where an injustice would result. Death is quite an injustice. 
sufficient weight to all relevant considerations, so clearly wrong that it resulted in an injustice, palpable and overriding error, and so on. And I want them to look at the corpses. The cases are unanimous that appellate courts cannot reweigh the evidence. We're not asking them to. We're saying don't let him weigh it at all, the medical evidence. Come up with their own conclusions and then replace those of the first instance court. Gee, they often do that, though. List a whole bunch of cases where we can't do it. In the interests of unity and simplicity, this violation of Section 7 must continue. In the interests of unity and simplicity. I sought to equate interlocutory discretionary orders with those described in housing that fall in the category of questions of mixed fact and law, though I acknowledge that some take the view that such orders have some features different from those said to be based on questions of mixed fact and law. 12. Putting aside these subtleties, what is common to all these verbal formulations is that in the absence of an error of law or legal principle, can't let people die when you've got a right to life, an appellate court cannot interfere with a discretionary order. He had the discretion to see who lives or dies. Unless there is an obvious, serious error that undercuts its integrity and viability. Well, the corpses do that. Underscore the error. This is a high test, one that the case law shows is rarely met. The deferential standard of review has applied in the past to discretionary orders appealed to this court, and it is the test we shall apply to interlocutory discretion order made by the federal court that is before us in these appeals. Analysis. Bearing in mind this standard of review, in my mind, the federal court did not commit reviewable error when it made its June 4th and July 9th orders. So cutting the people off and not letting them have their meds back was not reviewable. Isn't that sad? They got to die. Nothing you can do about it. The stay decision. On this issue, the federal court applied settled legal principles. The appellants have not demonstrated any error of law on the part of the court that people are dying after two years while they've been cut off from their meds and Allard can't help them? 15. Further, the decision to stay the self-represented litigants' challenges until the final disposition of the Allard challenge is supportable on the evidentiary record before the judge. Yeah, they got evidence out of the Crown for them, but nothing for us. No statement of defense, right? It is also supported by the federal court's ruling fi earlier findings that give rise to the May 7th order, an order that has not been appealed. Before the federal court was evidence suggesting that there was a significant overlap between the challenges brought by the self-represented litigants and the Allard challenge, and the federal court so found. The appellants urge us to reweigh the evidence. No, we don't the conclusion and find that there is not significant overlap. Given the standard of review, we cannot engage in that reviewing. There was evidence before the federal court supporting its finding that there was significant overlap. Yes, four out of 20 was significant, these judges agreed. <laughs> you know, they're all math dropouts, most lawyers and judges, right? So why wouldn't they agree four out of 20? Ah, oh, 17. The federal court also took into account issues of judicial resources. Yes, efficiency and the orderly conduct of multiple proceedings before the court. The court found the Allard challenge, one conducted by an experienced counsel, was significantly advanced and would assist the disposition of the self-represented litigant challenges, which we point out don't help them at all. But I guess he missed that part. In addition, the judge noted that other superior courts had temporarily stayed similar claims pending the determination of Allard challenge. Here again, on all these points of evidence, the federal court was capable of supporting its reasonings and findings. And those other challenges that were stayed upon agreement by the BC lawyers, okay? The decision for an interim relief. 
On this issue, again, the appellants have not demonstrated any error in legal principle on the part of the federal court. Just because people are dying, nothing wrong with the legal principle. The decision to dismiss the motions for interim constitutional exemption from the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act until final determination of the Allard Challenge is similarly supported, supportable on the evidentiary record before the judge. Hmm. Okay. So the 18,000 who got cut off and can't get it back through to Allard, that's supportable. But why Manson gave it to them without any evidence, that's not. 20. In an argument before us, the appellants encourage this court to reweigh the evidence and find differently. As I explained, an appellant court that must apply the appellate standard of review, the technicalities, this we cannot do. We can attend their funerals, but we can't help. 21. In dismissing the appellant's motions for interim constitutional exemption, the federal court relied on the following matters. Similar relief had been requested in the Allard Challenge, but had been refused as overly broad and inappropriate. Right? In this case, the federal court found that the requested relief was essentially unlimited and not tailored to remedying an alleged charter violation. What? So they didn't even answer, okay, without limitation, and PMU. While the appellant's challenges were stayed, Many would benefit from an earlier injunction of the federal court granted in Allard. Yeah, 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 the ATPs who got it, the 18,000 let-ins, substantially upheld on appeal. In its reasons in support of the May 7th order, the federal court stated it would remain prepared to consider motions for interim relief supported by adequate evidence brought by those who did not have the benefit of the earlier injunction and said that this reduces, if not eliminates, the potential for prejudice to them yeah, if the judge had accepted the affidavit sworn testament, but he decided to doubt it with no opposition from the Crown. I choose to not believe your sworn testimony, says the judge. I want to see your x-rays too. Mr. Turrell, the appellant in the lead filing these consolidated appeals, sought access to marijuana not to treat a recognized medical condition, but to prevent illness. The federal court held on the evidence that it was not satisfied marijuana's utility in preventing illness had been demonstrated. And pretty well only lawyers could think that way, right? Hadn't been demonstrated to them. The fact that it works for all these things doesn't mean it'll prevent it. That's a tough conclusion for them to get to. The appellants failed to establish that the medical exemption provided by the MMAR or MMPR violates their charter rights in a way that will be remedied by the constitutional exemption they seek. And of course, he forgets to mention how Manson did it, okay? He extended it to them, to the let-ins, so why not the other ones? A constitutional exemption was granted to Parker. However, for personal medical use, they didn't say it again. However, the federal court considered that Parker was distinguishable on the facts. In Parker, the relief arose from a finding of unconstitutionality and the granting of a temporary suspension of certain prevention, preventions of the CDSA, something that is not present in these cases. Further, the federal court observed that after Parker, the Supreme Court has significantly limited the availability of constitutional exemptions, citing R versus Ferguson. Okay, so they're basically saying that they forget about Parker's other two exemptions that were granted while the uh, exemption was working. So, the appellants have failed to supply sufficient evidence concerning their personal medical circumstances to warrant any interim relief, is what the judge said. Okay, The only evidence before the federal court was the limited information supplied by way of online template, an affidavit, sworn testimony, but no supporting documentary evidence on their current medical condition which we said was none of their business. Together, these matters, all supported by the evidence in the record, supplied the federal court with a basis to decide as it did, and we cannot interfere. So those arguments, those reasons, are validated by these guys. They can't interfere. Isn't that terrible? Before us, Mr. Tremell, on behalf of the appellant, stressed that the selection of a material date for granting relief to some, but not others, in the injunction granted to Allard is irrational. 
The distinction was based not on medical need, but rather on a non-medical criterion, namely the viability of the MMPR scheme. Mr. Termel submitted that the federal court erred in its June 4th order by continuing this same erroneous approach. He asked this court to remedy this by granting an exemption to all who would satisfy the criterion of medical need. The difficulty with this is the same as discussed above. The federal court found that the appellants offered insufficient evidence of medical need. So APP numbers weren't enough. Doctors got a right to look in your shorts. Where were you, Steve Burroughs? If only you'd known. In its view, the assertions in the template affidavit were not enough. Now, you know what they are. And they're sworn with no contravention by the Crown. Again, this is an assessment of the sufficiency or weight of evidence, a matter on which we must defer. So the judge said it wasn't enough, okay? And they'd have to defer to that. Ah, oh, poor people gotta die. 25. I said that in its May 7, 2014 order, the federal court left the door open for those who could establish by further and better proof than that found template affidavits that they had a medically verifiable need for medical marijuana. In their filings that led to the June 4th order, none of the appellants took the federal court offer up. And you know why a lot of them didn't? Because Justice Phelan said, when, we, when, we, when the Crown announces when the date is within seven days, who's on a protected list and who has to file these motions, everybody who's on the protected list and doesn't have to file the motions now got 10 more days to complain. But everybody who is on the unprotected list, well, you only got three more days. We're going to count the seven for the week where they took to tell you which list you're on. And the funniest part of all, the Crown didn't even send that list any information saying you weren't on the list. And that's why most people list the chance time to file an appeal against that decision. Isn't that neat what Phelan did? He said, you guys, you got 10 days from the date of the decision, but the guys who need to do something fast, you only got three. So, in their filings that led to the June 4th order, none of the appellants took up the federal court offer, but they all did submit their medical evidence to the federal court of appeal. In their appeal. So Stevie Burry's evidence of his tumor on his crotch, they got the pictures, okay? These judges here, looking at those pictures in his file, when they say, you can't have your exemption back. Cost. The parties agreed that cost in the amount of $3,350 all-inclusive collectively for all the appeals are appropriate, and Mr. Termal's undertaking on behalf of the appellants to pay them. Proposed disposition, and therefore I would dismiss Mr. Termal's appeal with costs in the amount of $3,350 all-inclusive. I would dismiss all the other's appeals without costs. So, that's it. So, what a horror story, eh? But at least you now know it. Now, the 26 people on our list may, for a lousy 75 bucks, file an application to the Supreme Court of Canada to ask them for the exemption. They should have got below, okay? And it's a heck of a trophy to have one of those. Now, a lot of people in the group have already been there before. I mean, Art Jakes to the Supreme Court once, Heidi's been there once, Robert Roy, Stephen Burroughs, Ray Termel, Terry Parker, they've all been there once, you know, a lot more guys have been there once, and uh, so not an opportunity for them to go a second time, and for the rest to have a nice trophy on their wall. At least they got their meds cut off by the highest court in the land. Nice thing to be able to say when prohibition's over and you can talk about the names of the judges who did it to you. So, that's all that's left to do in the civil actions at the moment. Uh, except for appeals that are going on with the amend people, but that's another story. And the best bet now happens to be the Smith Beano Quash, which I raised in there. Now, right now, the most important case going on is the Robert Nero, one of my famous med potters from ancient battles 15 years ago. And... Um, his case, his Smith Beano Quash motion, has been taken under advisement by Justice Rio Pell of the Ontario Superior Court in Timmins. And just like Justice Rogan 
for JP in 2003. If he quashes the charge, that means that the Crown's going to have to withdraw all the charges in Ontario, like they did last time. And then, when they lose Nero's appeal, then they're going to have to withdraw the charges in the rest of the country, like they withdrew the 4,000 in 2003. Now, we have Sean Tedder trying to get his Smith Beano quash heard in Toronto, and it's been stalled five times. And it's supposed to be heralded by the first judge he meets who can fix a typo on an indictment. Same with the boys in Montreal. Three guys in Montreal are having theirs stalled five times, and it's been put off a year to a pretrial before they even know there's going to be a charge. So, and there are a few other people who are filing their Smith Beano quashes. And that seems to be the way to go because three days before on Friday on the 8th in Ottawa, the Crown withdrew the charges against James Turner. And he's been using my kits to fight his charges that were laid in 2006. And he lost them all, once to the Supreme Court of Canada. And here he is coming up with his trial in February after nine years. And he filed his Smith Beano Quash in August. And after four stalls with no more stalled coming up in January. The Crown withdrew all the charges, and he was charged with cultivating 2,879 plants. And they said they had no chance of conviction under a cultivation charge for a guy with 2,879 plants. What changed after nine years in the last half year? Smith be no quash. So they know that Smith meant the law was invalid when all these people are charged. And they're just trying to get as many convictions as they can before they drop the remainder, like they did last time. Because last time, Supreme Court didn't make them expunge the charges while the laws were dead. And they're hoping everybody they get now, they won't expunge those criminal records either. Just the last guys left. But the point is, we're asking for expunging of charges too by Justice Riopelle, as well as striking marijuana off the schedule. So everything asked for in here because of a bad exemption, no offense. We asked for that here too. If our actions had gone forward in federal court, we would have, when Smith came down, said, ah, there's proof, our point number nine in common, that there was a bad exemption. Now grant us no offense because Conroy didn't ask. Get it? In their last arguments, they tried to sneak it in, strike marijuana off schedule too, and the Crown objected. You guys didn't have that originally. Well, I did. And if they hadn't stopped me when Smith wins, I would have moved and said, here, Smith be no quash in the federal courts. And Phelan stopped me. So now we have to do it in the provincial courts because we've been stopped everywhere there. We have our last glory shots at the Supreme Court of Canada for 75 bucks. And if you're free, they will dispense with that filing fee. And uh, But that's it. Civil court is kind of... Um, out of action now with these kind of decisions. And, you know, if they're going to let 18,000 people continue to suffer in angst after having had their Medicaid, cheap medication cut off, there's really nothing more we can do but to simply get it at the top, saying, I've been cut off, and this, these three judges at the Supreme Court of Canada won't give me back my money. So that's it. Anybody interested, you just go to my site, johntermel.com slash smithbinoquash. But all kits are available, legal kits, for all different forms and actions at johntermell.com slash kits. So the war continues. Smith Beano Quash is on the agenda in Timmins. We want to, but that's higher. That's Superior Court. That's spectacularly great start to the fight. Most everybody else is below one level, and we have to appeal to Superior Court before getting to the Court of Appeal. So let's say a prayer for Robert Narrows, Judge Justice Riopel, that he sees that they wouldn't withdraw Turner with 2,800 plants after nine years, no prospect of conviction for cultivation. I hope he understands what that means. So anyway, fingers crossed, action continues in criminal courts wherever we can find anybody. And if you are one of the leftouts, the only people who can help you now are people in the criminal courts. So you gotta find anybody who's been busted and if he can go and lay that motion for to quash and win it, then you can vote in. It's your only way to get your grow ops back fast is by helping strike down the law now, okay? Getting you your exemptions back, that's gone, you can see. But getting the law struck down, that's not. 
So there you go. You can do something still, but it's in the criminal you got to go and find people who have busts that make the quash motion available and start flooding the courts with them. Okay, so John the Engineer Termel signing off and uh, the action continues.